In the last few lectures, we've introduced the concept of plane waves and we've been looking at how they behave under different circumstances. And here we will talk about plane waves at interfaces. The learning objectives are to familiarize ourselves with the Snell's law, which is something that guides the amount of reflection and refraction and the direction uh, of reflection and refraction. And once we have uh, acquired the necessary level of understanding for the Snell's law, we will then focus on a special case of total internal reflection, uh, which we will analyze further. So, first of all, we can consider a plane wave that is incident obliquely with uh, an interface, and that obliquity is given by the angle theta sub i with respect to the normal shown here it's along the z-axis and this will give rise to the reflected wave at theta r and a transmitter wave at theta t to determine the amplitudes of the reflected and transmitter wave we must analyze the boundary conditions and those are the rephrasings of Maxwell's equations that we have learned about before and from first principles of conservation of momentum, we'll be able to figure out uh, what those angles are, go are need to be in order to satisfy those boundary conditions, both for a reflected beam and for the transmitted beam as well. So if we say that a photon traveling as part of a plane wave, obliquely, um, carries a momentum given by this expression, where h bar is Planck's constant, b beta is the phase constant, and this is our uh, direction uh, vector. Then what we can do is we can look at the x component of our momentum, and based on the um, boundary condition on the tangential component of e, we can talk about uh, the tangential component of momentum and that would correspond to the x component which would have to be exactly accounted for on one side of the interface and the other. And if we look at these expressions uh, quite simply we recognize that h bar is this h bar from here and these omega square roots are the re-expressions of beta uh, with material properties expanded. And since we only care about the x component, we look in this direction vector and we recognize that the x component carries a sign of theta i, which means that all of these vectors have to be sine of theta i. And then it becomes a matter of saying which uh, momentum has to be equal to which momentum and we get these two expressions um, because the initial the incident and the reflected beam have to be equal that means that we can cancel a bunch of terms and sine theta i and sine theta r have to be equal that means that theta i is equal to theta r similarly if we look at the incident beam and the transmitted beam they also have to be continuous and that means that after we cancel out h bar and omega, we get this expression. It is more common in optics to recognize this component and this component as index of refraction. And so this expression becomes n1 sine theta i is equal to n2 sine theta t. And these two equations for reflection and transmission are known uh, as Snell's laws. Snell's law is of particular importance when we are concerned with tasks like modeling human vision in order to understand what kind of corrections one would need to perform in order for the eyes to be corrected for the errors that uh, um, a given human was born with. But later on in the context of this class where we're concerned with the transformation of uh, information from 
uh, one point to the other, we will need the concept uh, of Snell's law in order to understand optical fiber, uh, which relies on Snell's law in order to uh, contain the light field within the fiber. Another concept of interest is total internal reflection. But before we discuss it, we need to understand how Snell's law impacts the transmission angles. And we clearly see that it will depend on N1 and N2, the two indices of our two materials in question. So if we look back at our initial example, we can select arbitrary N1 and arbitrary N2, but we can recognize N1 um, being equal to unity as free space or vacuum or close enough to air. And then N2 is going to be a typical glass, uh, something like a BK7. So if N2 is greater than N1, like we have here, then sine theta t has to be less than sine theta i, and that means that theta t is also less than, sin, uh, less than theta i. That means that this angle right here has to be smaller and the ray will bend towards the normal, the normal being uh, along the z-axis once again. However, as the discrepancy between the two indices of refraction uh, decreases, so it's no longer 1 and 1.5, but uh, it come, keeps going down, then this angle will also increase. And then the special case of when n1 is equal to n2, theta i will be equal to theta t. This scenario uh, is sometimes refers to, is referred to as two media being isorefractive, which simply restates that the two angles are equal, the incident and the transmitted. If we allow n2 to be less than n1, that means that sine theta t is greater than sine theta i, meaning that this angle is greater than theta i, meaning that the wave refracts away from the normal. And as we uh, look further at what um, the natural limit for sine theta t could be, uh, that of being 1, then we can then become interested with the case that theta, theta t is equal to pi over 2. And then denote it here. And for this um, particularly designed scenario of having an, about a 39 uh, degree incident angle and an n1 of 1.6 and n2 of 1 produces uh, sine theta t is equal to 1. In this scenario, the transmitted wave that we see here is propagating parallel to the interface and no power crosses the interface. What this means is that the entire wave must be reflected and we have total internal reflection because if there is no power flow over here then whatever power flow reaches uh, on this side must be exactly reflected back because there is no other option for things to remain continuous. And theta c shown here is exactly that condition calculated in, in reverse where we set sine theta t to be equal to 1 in order to figure out what n2 and n1 will uh, produce uh, for the critical angle. So as you can see, when this angle theta i is greater than theta c, then all of a sudden sine theta t uh, becomes greater than 1, which might be a problem, but in reality it's okay because theta t can also be complex, which means that the momentum that we were talking about in the background uh, are re-expressed and we have uh, both a propagating and a decaying uh, momentum with different parts being assigned to different directions. Furthermore, cosine theta t is going to be equal to square root of 1 minus sine squared 
theta i, and that will be purely imaginary. When we write the electric field, which is given as E naught times this exponential that carries the phase constant and the direction, we can see that the component of cosine theta t z will in fact be imaginary, will combine with this negative j out front and will produce a real decay. So putting that in one step further, we we'll recognize that this is a decaying term. That means that this wave is evanescent as it decays in the z direction instead of propagating. So this is what is being denoted here, this gradient uh, down with respect to z direction it is exponential and it comes exactly from this term right here. And the reason for this wave to exist is again continuity of fields, continu uh, continuity or conservation of momentum. And we can look at how much time does it take uh, since the uh, starting of the incident beam for this evanescent wave to be pumped up. And for most of the cases, most of the optical uh, cases, that number is on the order of uh, femtoseconds, which means that uh, this incident wave uh, comes in, some portion of it pumps up uh, the evanescent wave, and then after a very, very, very brief amount of time, the reflection component uh, reaches 100% with uh, this being uh, virtually unchanging and no, and no power flow existing within it. Again, it's worth reiterating that this transition period of the evanescent wave being pumped up and, and then all of the uh, incident wave being reflected thereafter is a necessity of the boundary conditions which are imposed by this discontinuity of N1 and N2 at the interface dictating certain conditions on um, electric field and certain conditions on momentum. To move on to tutorial topics, we will discuss um, Snell's law for dielectric interfaces further. We'll look at refraction and thin lenses and uh, We'll also look at uh, some total internal reflection examples.